Okay, uh, we want to go ahead and talk a little bit about the Enlightenment and how really uh, the Enlightenment is an era of incredible change and, uh, and everything from government to art um, to the way we think about the world. In fact, uh, we, we switch to a, a mindset where we're really, it changes from a faith in the supernatural, a faith in God, a faith in religion, it's really almost a faith in ourselves, a faith in human reason. And that's a big, uh, big theme that you find throughout the Enlightenment is, is the focus becomes more and more on humanity and on our own abilities. Uh, in fact, the Enlightenment is sometimes referred to as, again, the age of reason. And the time period that we're talking about here is generally thought to be about the 1700s. Uh, some of the early influences predate that. Some folks like Thomas Aquinas, who was a Dominican friar, uh, lived from 1225 to 1274. Uh, his most notable work is a, is a piece called the Summa Theologica. Um, guys like uh, Michael uh, de Montaigne, uh, obviously by the name, a French writer, uh, lives in the 1500s, uh, and, and uh, he famously uh, really focuses in on human reason and human knowledge, uh, uh, especially in his most famous essays, and he writes a, a bunch of essays mostly. Uh, Apology for Raymond Sivand uh, is his longest essay, probably his best known, uh, and the motto that comes out of that is what do I know? Again, a focus on, on, on your knowledge, uh, on your own reason. What is it that you know? And then, uh, probably most famously, now getting closer to the 1700s, René Descartes, uh, Descartes um, a French mathematician, philosopher, uh, who uh, lives from 1596 to 1650. Uh, and his most notable work is something called The Meditations on First Philosophy. And these guys, they begin to start to develop a system of beliefs uh, where, again, a faith in any reason, where people could solve every social problem, every political problem, uh, every economic problem, uh, through their own thought, through their own ideas, through examining what works, what doesn't, examining nature, um, a belief that, that even truth itself was something that was within, within the human mind's ability to attain, that, that through our reason, through deduction, through examining nature, that we could discover truth for ourselves, that truth didn't need to be revealed to us. And this is a huge shift. Uh, again, w whereas before the Enlightenment, the holder of truth was religion, the Catholic Church. Truth was something that was revealed to man, that we were incapable of discovering for ourselves. And through rationalism, through the Enlightenment, it's a, they start to think, no, no, we can figure it out. Um, we can figure out what truth is. And probably some of the best evidence of this is the belief in natural law, the use of reason to determine universal codes of human behavior, what's right and what's wrong. If you, if you look to nature, you can figure this out. And, and so you almost see through the Enlightenment where human thought and, and the human mind begins to displace religion. Although a lot of the thinkers were themselves very, very religious. I don't, I don't want to make it seem like they were secularists. Again, Thomas Aquinas, he's a saint, um, a big belief in human reason. But these guys didn't see that as a conflict between reason and religion. A lot of them themselves, again, very religious individuals. Uh, some of the philosophers who were most notable from the Enlightenment, guys like John Locke, he was a British philosopher, and he was big into something called natural rights. Uh, these are things, as he understood them, that we might recognize. His, according to him, like his, the natural rights included things like life, liberty, and property. Again, Thomas Jefferson takes his inspiration for the Declaration of Independence in many regards directly from John Locke. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and Jefferson rephrases it, the pursuit of happiness, but he's really quoting Locke there. He's really drawing directly from Locke. Locke also develops ideas about the social contract. The social contract is not something that's unique to Locke, although Locke has his own take on it, but he believes that the government should be limited with very specific defined duties. And further, that if the government failed in those duties, if the government didn't protect our rights, that's really what he viewed the purpose of government to be, then it was the people's right to throw off bad government and to get rid of it. And he expresses these beliefs and others in his most famous work, which is John Locke's Two Treaties on Government. Uh, go down to Barnes & Noble, pick it up, you can still read it today. Uh, a fascinating work. Uh, other guys who were influential to uh, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and who were huge Enlightenment th uh, thinkers, guys like Baron de Montesquieu, uh, Montesquieu, uh, again, 1689, 1755, he's right in the middle of all this. His big thing is, look, if you want a government that's going to, to protect people, that people don't have to be afraid of, and that people that will protect people from other people, you need to divide up the power of government. He was a big advocate for the three branches of government. Uh, 
judicial, legislative, and executive. Again, sound familiar? Montesquieu was hugely influential on the writing of the United States Constitution. James Madison and a lot of the, the, the authors of the Constitution quote Montesquieu more than any other document with the exception of the Bible. Uh, so hugely influential. Uh, and his most influential work is called The Spirit of the Laws. And again, something that you can go find today in bookstores. Voltaire, uh, which was actually a pen name. His, his real name was Francois Marie Array. Um, but he writes using the name Voltaire, and he's most famous as, as Voltaire today. Lives again, 1694, 1778. So again, we're talking right around the... the uh, uh, he, he lived to see the American Revolution. And he advocates things like freedom of speech and political freedom, freedom of religion, and separation of church and state. Again, these are things that, that we're very familiar with because they directly relate to, to our system of government. And in one of his more famous works, the Candide, uh, Voltaire, not only a philosopher, but a prolific writer, uh, of all sorts, poems, plays, uh, philosophies, uh, just wrote volumes. Uh, and again, because of that, very influential. Uh, other guys, uh, and again, there's there's a whole host of these, but these are some of the more influential. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who lived from 1712 to 1778. He was ethnically French, even though uh, he was actually from Geneva, uh, which is uh, Switzerland. He, his family were French Huguenots, French um, Protestants, if you will. So they left France and they, they went to uh, they went they went to Switzerland and, and settled in Geneva. But some of his big ideas, again, about the social contract, the, the, the deal between government and people, he said the people are sovereign. It's the people who hold the power, and that the government should serve the people. Again, sounds familiar because it is familiar. Those are ideas expressed in our Constitution, in our Declaration of Independence. But he doesn't limit his ideas to things just about government. Really, the reason why we have schools today, public schools at least, is is it goes back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He believed in a national education system. He expresses his ideas on education in a book called Emile, or otherwise known as On Education. Uh, and the underlying philosophy here is that, that, you know, that people can be raised to be good citizens, because pe people are basically good if they have the right environment. So if you just put them in the right school, if you just give them the right influences, people will be good and they'll make better citizens, which will make better government and, and, and it will solve social problems. It'll solve government problems. Other guys like Dennis Diderot, uh, editor of the Encyclopedia, um, which is the, the English kind of name for it, um, but literally the Encyclopedia. And, and he, he wasn't so much a writer himself, but he, he was trying to, to go ahead and gather all of these different ideas that, um, that were being expressed around this time. And, and he collects them together and, and, and basically publishes an encyclopedia. He's the editor of it. And it's a collection of enlightenment thought from all over Europe. Uh, very controversial, ends up being banned by the church being and is banned by different governments. Um, and economics, new ideas about economics. The, uh, the prevailing wisdom was something called mercantilism that drove the British Empire and uh, drove colonialism and things like that. Uh, during the Enlightenment, we start to move away from that. We say, you know what? Government shouldn't be involved in economics. Rather, that's really an individual, a free choice between individuals and and. and and that's something that the government doesn't need to regulate, and that's called laissez-faire. And that really replaces mercantilism. Uh, and, and one of the chief advocates of this is a, is a British economist by the name of Adam Smith. He's really the father of modern economics. If you've ever taken economics, what you're really studying is are the ideas of Adam Smith. One of his big things, the invisible hand, uh, and how markets work with free choice in between producers and consumers. He really advocates for the free market. And that's still hugely, you know, supply and demand, hugely influential on, on our thinking in regards to the econ economics today. And he views purpose of government not to be involved with economic decisions, but rather just to protect people, but to protect their rights, provide for justice, maybe to carry out public works, but, but not to be involved in, in the economy, but rather to support it. New ideas about government, uh, again, all over the place. Uh, and in Europe, uh, new governments start to adopt some of them. But monarchs don't go ahead and just give up their power. Uh, rather, they, they shift slowly and they become what are called enlightened despots. They're absolute monarchs, which is kind of not really in line with a lot of enlightenment ideas. But they adopt as many enlightenment ideals as they can. And so they're, again, an enlightened despot. They never give up the power, but they do make government more efficient. They do simplify laws. They get rid of serfdom. Uh, they practice religious tolerance. They end torture. These are all things that are very much influenced by the enlightenment. Some of the most notable examples from around Europe include Catherine the Great from Russia, Frederick the Great from Prussia, which 
today, when you think of Prussia, think Germany. Go look to Germany and, and the Prussia, uh, the Prussia is over in that area. There was no Germany yet, but Prussia was starting to put that together. Uh, Joseph uh, II from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. These were all examples of government that was changing, and these were enlightened despots. Uh, it's really a time period of the rise of the isms. Uh, again, a rise of, of nation states, nationalism, where people are loyal to a nation or to a government, to the state. Uh, the rise of capitalism. Again, that's the laissez-faire idea. Adam Smith. Adam Smith never called it capitalism. Ironically, that's actually a term used by Karl Marx to describe what Adam Smith was doing. And Marxism and capitalism are, in some ways, very much at odds with one another. Um, and so, ironically, we, we refer to Adam Smith's ideas by the term that was used to describe them by one of Adam Smith's, I guess, not rivals, but somebody who disagreed with Smith. Um, militarism, a glorification of the growth of national professional armies uh, really starts to, to come out of this and you start to get uh, a much more militaristic with the rise of nation states militaristic view where they start to develop their, these armies to protect themselves new trends in art uh, Baroque is an, uh, a style in art uh, best exemplified by Peter Paul Rubens and it was huge paintings colorful paintings, lots going on bright colors, very exciting a lot of times religious themes and then following shortly thereafter the, the Baroque themes, Rococo, which is sometimes referred to as uh, the second Baroque. Um, Rococo, uh, not quite so bright, not so, so, but the, the colors are more pastels, softer. There's fewer religious themes, more, more themes around nature and soothing themes, things that are graceful and fluid. Uh, and then in, in huge developments in music, uh, this is the time period of Mozart and Handel and Bach and Hayden. Uh, so again, uh, tremendous changes in, in music. And then in literature, some of the more uh, relevant literature to come out of the Enlightenment. Gulliver's Travels, written by Jonathan Swift, and Robinson Crusoe, written by uh, Daniel Defoe, are, are influential novels which are, are still read today.